Cool. Let's start talking about substitution reactions some more. Um, what we're going to add today is basically a second mechanism for substitution reactions. So we, we did SN2 reactions on Tuesday. Um, and that was, and a reminder, that was substitution nucleophilic second order. So one of the things that gets tricky about that is the two, you have to remember that that's second order or bimolecular, not two steps. The only reason I'm even putting that out there is because we're going to introduce SN1 today, which is a unimolecular reaction, meaning first order, which means it's two steps. So it gets a little bit backwards. You have to remember the context is we're talking the, the reaction rate is second order for SN2. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, So we ended talking about these the other day. We said, okay, and as a reminder, and let me fix that typo once again um, on NH2. Um, so that, that uh, mechanism in general is our nucleophile attacks a lone pair from our nucleophile attacks, regardless of what it looks like, it's got to have a lone pair to be a nucleophile. And then our, our halide is going to leave at the same time, right? So we wind up with that planar transition state. It went through that umbrella flip where we flip the stereochemistry because if, if hydroxide has to attack from, from the opposite side of the molecule as the chloride, when the chloride leaves, the hydroxide has to be coming in from behind. And that means that, that those reagents that are left are going to invert. So if the three reag or the three substituents still attach to the carbon here, if right here they're all pointed away from the chlorine, when we bring our hydroxide in, they're all going to have to be facing away from the hydroxide. So you're going to wind up with your hydroxide in the rear position. And you know what? I found out worked pretty well doing this on last spring. I'll just throw mole view up on the right hand side of the screen here. And I'll draw my molecules in that. So our product then would look like everything's the same except we wind up with the hydroxide in the rear position, right? Our chloride leaves, hydroxide comes in. We're specifically only going to get one stereoisomer out of this. Um, on our second example here, the mechanism would look almost identical the negative charge, if the lone pairs aren't drawn, you can either draw the lone pairs to show them to draw your mechanism here. So NH2 is gonna look a lot like a water molecule, except that NH2 um, has a negative charge. Um, so you can either draw it um, from the lone pair. It's also fairly common if you have a negative charge to draw the charge attacking. Um, you just have to be careful that only works for a negative charge, right? Because we're showing when we show mechanisms, we're showing the electrons moving. So a positive charge, you can't draw an arrow from a positive charge. You draw an arrow to a positive charge. And bromide leaves. So our product here. It's going to look, every, the rest of the molecule all still stays the same. We're just going to wind up now with our NH2 is going to be attached and sticking out towards us. Um, 
Um, and again, for whatever reason, Moldview doesn't like to draw the hydrogens easily, um, doesn't default to showing it as NH2. Um, so if you want to show the hydrogens, you have to draw them that way. And that's mainly, it's not ne technically necessary for a skeletal structure. Skeletal structure, this is actually fine for a skeletal structure, um, but it's convenient and you see it in most textbooks in if you have functional groups like an OH or an NH2, they will write the, um, the hydrogens in as sort of a, that mixed condensed structure, just so that you remember how many hydrogens there are attached there. Um, but again, Moldview doesn't do that. Um, if I had to guess, I'd say Moldview was designed by people that work more in the biology side than, than the pure chemistry or the physics side, because it also will let you, if you haven't seen this yet, um, if you search for a name of a protein in the search bar for Moldview, it'll actually give you a protein structure. So if you put in hemoglobin, it gives it as a protein structure, not just as a skeletal structure. Um, which is kind of cool when you're studying biology, if you want to get a, get a good 3D model of a protein that you can kind of click and zoom around in. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun to play around with that. Um, but we are not there yet. We'll get there. All right, so SN2, about as simple a mechanism as you can get which means it's really good for us to kind of look at some of what are some of the variables that can affect things like rate and which competing mechanism it goes through. So we're gonna bring in some more, some more information. So a lot of text on this slide, but it just says that our, we, I mentioned before that for SN2 reactions, the more carbons we have around that center, around our leaving group, the slower it goes. So for an SN2 reaction, whatever we have, the most spinach around our active site is gonna go the slowest. So it's gonna go in a really predictable order, just like with our carbocation stability, um, but for a different reason. I can't even count to five. See, organic chemists have trouble counting to five. This is, this is a known thing. Four goes on the right-hand side. So in the case of, of carbocations, it had to do with you needed carbons nearby that had sigma bonds that could donate electron density to stabilize those carbocations, right? Um, even if you didn't remember, that was the reason why that's, you guys all, you know, figured out, um, you know, tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary, more stable than primary, more stable than methyl. Um, why is it that, that is a mechanism that doesn't involve a carbocation at all would have a similar ordering what was it about the tertiary carbon that made it harder to go through this reaction? Anybody remember? It had to do with uh, all that spinach around there. Are you, are you looking for that there's more carbons? There's just more stuff in the way. Basically, it's a it's more of a steric issue. So just like having two big groups in the axial positions on um, on a cyclohexane, they wound up bumping into each other. Sorry, my daughter's having a moment. Um, just like they wound up bumping into each other that way, we wound up with more stuff in the way. Um, and that that term spinach, I'm going to keep coming back to that because it's apparently a, a um, well known term. Um, on a plate, if you're really, if you really just want your, your meat and potatoes, the spinach is just getting in the way, right? You're pushing the spinach out of the way to get to the meat and potatoes. Um, so the more stuff you have around, the bigger the groups are around your active carbon, 
the slower your reaction is going to go. Um, so, and that, that makes a lot of sense. And so we can actually, if we start looking at bigger and bigger groups, if we take those same molecules I was just showing you and look at bigger and bigger groups, um, and these are just reaction rates that are relative to each other. So they don't really have units on them. They're just saying, let's call a secondary, a secondary group, um, call that one. And then relative to that, a primary halide, a primary bromide leaves 16 times faster. And a primary bromide that's on, that only has an ethyl group attached. So just still primary, just a smaller group instead of a propyl group, it's, a, it's an ethyl group, goes 40 times faster than if it was secondary. And if you make it a methyl bromide, it goes 1200 times faster. So we see sort of a logarithmic or exponential relationship here that's going to have to do with either um, lowering the transition state energy or just the odds of having your nucleophile um, have access to that active carbon are going to result in these really, really dramatic shifts in reaction rate. And if we look at a tertiary, um, they just say too slow to measure. So because we know that everything that can happen does happen they won't say that it, it does not occur it occurs just too slow to measure in a lab um so that means that we would expect that a tertiary bromide will basically especially if we're sticking to at room temperature we could say that it shouldn't react via the sn1 there should be no way for this reaction to happen in a reasonable time frame um, however, when we do the experiment, we actually see that the reaction happens really quickly. So if it reacted, we would wind up with the, the mechanism would look like our water acting as a nucleophile, coming in opposite the bromide, the bromide leaving. And then we wind up with, with something where we have an extra hydrogen still attached here. So we just have to go through a second proton transfer step where the where you need something, either another water molecule or a bromide, whatever's convenient to draw it. You can draw it that as grabbing the H. And then the oxygen just holds on to, to that there, that uh, bond. Um, and so that's. If you remember when we were talking about proton transfer steps, I said they show up all over the place, but they're not usually the main attraction. They're not usually the biggest, most important part of a mechanism. They're usually either setting something up to be a good leaving group or cleaning up after the fact to make it look like a more stable molecule. Um, and so that's, that's an example of this right here. We don't even consider that proton transfer step to be part of the SN2 reaction per se, the SN2 reaction is this first step. Um, when we do this though, we actually see this reaction happens really, really quickly, depending on the conditions. Um, so that, that threw everybody for a loop. So then they went and they started trying to do the same investigation that they did for, to figure out how SN2 worked. And they found out that the rate law was not the same. For SN2 reactions, it's the rate law would depend on the concentration both of the water and of, of your alkyl halide, right? That's what made it second order. You needed both of these things to run into each other at the same time. But when we look at the um, reaction mechanism for this reaction, they find that the amount of nucleophile doesn't change it. The amount of nucleophile doesn't affect the rate whatsoever. So that's that's interesting. Um, this is a little unexpected, but what could, so what does that tell us about the mechanism? If the rate law is first order, what does it tell us?
whatever's happening is happening with the Halo out game more so than whatever else is in there? Yeah, exactly. It means that what the slowest part of the reaction only involves the halo alkane because it doesn't matter how much we it's not relying on the on the water running into it because then it would still be second order so whatever the rate determining step is only involves one molecule and when your rate determining step doesn't involve both of your reactants that's actually a clue right there it can't be a concerted reaction. It can't be a one-step reaction if you don't have every piece of your reactants in the rate law, right? It has to be happening in two steps because this, whatever's, whatever is happening slowly only involves one of these pieces. I'm trying to think of a good macroscopic analogy for that. Um, and I'm blanking off the top of my head, but but essentially it just it if it was going to happen all in one step, we would need all the pieces to be there at the same time. The fact that not all the pieces are there tells us it's more than one step. So, what could be happening? Yes, yeah, waiting for Nevada to count their votes. You don't need to be continually checking right now if you're uh, if you're in Nevada. Um, they said yesterday they're releasing more of their. I, I don't know if it's going to be all of their votes, um, all of their results at, but it's going to be at noon Eastern, which is nine o'clock here. So I'll make sure we take our break around there. Everybody can go, you know, hit hit refresh on their on their uh, internet browser for a few minutes while we wait to see if Nevada gets their act together. Um, So how do we look at this and um, figure out what a reasonable mechanism can be? We know that the overall reaction looks like our substitution reaction, right? Our leaving group has to leave and we need our nucleophile to come in. So what could be different about this one? I'll go back and look at the other mechanism. Here was our other mechanism. We had two arrows drawn. Each of those arrows was a different pattern, right? We had leaving group leaves and nucleophile attacks. So what's this one? It's gonna wind up being leaving group leaves, but I don't know if the bromine interacts with the water by itself first or? No. Generally speaking, for these first order reactions, the slow step is just leaving group leaves. And that means that we wind up with a intermediate. So this is this is what I meant by um, it has to be a, a two-step process. Our intermediate now is just gonna look like this. We wind up with bromide leaves, and it leaves behind a carbocation because it takes the bromine is more electronegative than the carbon. It takes the, the electrons with it when it leaves. So, in other words, it's the same mechanism as before. We're just breaking it up into two steps because then what can happen? Now we have something that's a really good target for a nucleophile, right? A positive charge is going to be really attractive to the partial negative on a water. So our new mechanism is just going to look like, I have to switch annotation tools here, this, ideally with that being a lone pair that you drew that from. And then we wind up with one more proton transfer step at the end. So it's the exact same reaction. We just break it up into two pieces. Leaving group leaves first, and then your nucleophile comes in, as opposed to being all one step. All right, so 
that's, again, that's interesting. Why do we even bother de delineating between the two when we have these two things both happening at the same time and they're both making the same product, why bother even describing SN2 versus SN1? Sean, I'm sorry, can you, can you draw what you want that reaction to look like? Yeah, so let me switch. I'll do it on the whiteboard so I can make it look better. <coughs> so the, the first step is just going to look like that. That's the only arrow that you would draw for the mechanism for the first step. And then what that leaves behind is a tertiary carbocation. And then you have your bromide is now floating around. And this is where the water comes in. So the water, this is why it's a not a second order reaction is because the slow step here is the first step and then the water comes in. Wait, so do you not uh, not want us to, in the first bit before the arrow, do you not want us to draw the plus H2O? You want us to draw it down there in the second step after the reaction? It doesn't matter where, where it's drawn. I'm just, so that I can be consistent with the fact that we don't usually draw, we don't usually draw arrows from the reactants here or mechanism arrows from here to over there. Mm -hmm. I'm re rewriting the H2O, and I was just showing that it doesn't participate in this first step, which is why it's a first order reaction. Okay. Because only this atom, only this molecule's concentration mm -hmm. determines the slow step. Or okay. So we would always draw it without the H2O in the beginning. I will usually give it to you as the H2O. So the, so the way that I would write this on a test is I would write out the entire reaction Mm -hmm. both reactants and products and then you have to draw the steps to get there mm -hmm. and so if you wanted to just leave the water there and draw a down downward arrow showing your first step or if you wanted to redraw it however you wanted to redraw it i'm not going to be super picky about that i'm more picky about um, making sure that your arrows are drawn from electrons to nuclei or charges at least and um, that you get the right number of steps and intermediates Okay. You guys can't read my mind yet? Come on now. <laughs> You'll get there. The end of this, if you ask the other OCHEM students, if you ask Aaron, uh, by the end, they could usually tell exactly what I was asking without me having to clarify, mostly because you get used to how I say things and write things. Um, so this is going to be our second step then. And then our, so then our arrow after that second step, I'm gonna erase the left-hand side here for the sake of drawing our next technically intermediate would look like. Would look like this. We have our water, our nucleophile just made a new bond to the carbocation which now means we have an oxygen with three bonds, which isn't stable, but it's better than having a carbocation because the carbocation doesn't have a full valence on the carbon, right? So this allows us, it's the same logic for why that resonance structure where we had a double bond, an oxygen with three bonds and a positive charge was more stable than a carbocation. Carbocations have a partially empty valence and that's a bigger deal than putting a positive charge on an oxygen. Everything having full valence is more stable than um, even if it does put a positive charge on oxygen. So then our last step, and you can either draw the, you need something that's gonna act as a base and take one of these extra H pluses. Um, frequently it's drawn as whatever your leaving group was, can act as the base and accept the extra proton. 
Um, it could also be another molecule of your nucleophile. If you have more water around, water could act as a base and make hydronium. Um, and I, again, I'm not going to be picky about that, whatever is convenient and makes sense to you. And we just wind up with a proton transfer step. Right, so, and that's going to result, our final result here then is going to be the OH group and HDR. Or if you use water as your base, it'd be plus H3O plus at the end. Um, but again, it's not, I'm not going to be super picky about this. This just makes the stoichiometry work out. So you get start with two molecules, you end with two molecules. All right, so any, any questions so far? This all makes sense, right? Just like SN2, it all made sense when I presented it to you. And then I said, well, but then sometimes it doesn't happen that way. Um, so we'll keep going over this. What, and I try to go at, a, at what feels to me like a pretty slow pace um, and not because it's, I'm, I'm not learning this for the first time, but I'm trying to remember what it felt like learning this the first time. Um, but if I, so if I'm going too slow or too fast, just let me know. I think there's even little buttons on your, um, wh where you would say raise hand on your um, manage, or if you look over at your manage participants or participants tab where you can hit the digital raise hand, there's even a button to say go faster. Um, so I don't know what that looks like if it pops up a little notification for me or something, but I'll pay attention to it. So what is that going to look like as a potential energy surface now? If I wanted to remember a potential energy surface like number eight on the, I think it was eight on the, uh, on the exam where we looked at reactants and intermediates and transition states and we had that, those lines. If we have energy versus reaction, what is that gonna look like? for a two-step reaction. Cody? A little bit more bumpy than a one-step. It's gonna have a couple more intermediates. Yeah, so if, if a one-step reaction looked just like this, products to reactants, a two-step reaction has to have an intermediate that's at a potential minimum, that's at a local minimum. So it looks something more like that at the very least we have to have two steps there really we'd have three steps if we have the um, proton transfer step that has to happen at the end but let's let's leave that off for now um which of these two bumps is going to be bigger you know what i can even how about that i even have a an Excel sheet I can use to do this. If it's gonna be a two-step reaction, I'm gonna make this look simpler. We have a two-step reaction happening. And don't worry so much about the exact shape of this. Um, which of these two steps is going to be bigger? The first transition state or the second transition state? I want to say the first one because the carbocation might be more unstable. Yeah, and that, that would kind of make sense too because that's the step that only involves one of our reactants was leaving group leaves, right? So the first step, we would expect that to be a bigger transition state, then the second step, let's say that that is going from 13 to, so maybe something more like that. 
and again, I, the exact numbers don't matter for this for this type of problem. I'm just looking qualitatively which of these bumps is bigger, and the fact that there are two, there isn't a stable intermediate in the middle. Sean, I have a question. Yeah. Um, would so would SN one reactions would there be a higher like overall transition state to get over because it's a slower reaction than compared to SN two, or is it kind of like you know even out because it's two steps? So good question. So overall, we we would in the SN two reaction we didn't make any unstable intermediates, right? We didn't make anything that was less stable at the end. And really, this would be downhill in energy, so we'll call that something like that instead. Um, so if we're starting at at the at here, we have a big transition state to go through to get to that carbocation intermediate, which is less stable than what we started with because we made a carbocation but then it's gonna be really easy for it to react and make the product because you have an unstable intermediate. This is gonna be, have a really big um, equilibrium constant to go downhill in energy that much. So under, under normal circumstances, if we're looking at something, um, if we wanna tr truly imagine these reactions happening in a very isolated system, we think about them happening in the gas phase. We're talking about these molecules running into each other. There are no, there's no stabilization happening due to solvents. There's no other things getting in the way. Um, we would normally expect SN2 to be faster than SN1 in, in the gas phase because we have to go through this big transition state to make a less stable intermediate, which then can react again. Right, so just based on, on our knowledge of chemistry in general, we would expect this to be slower than an SN2 reaction. SN2, we're not making anything unstable. It's all happening at once, one step. So the fact that this happens at all, it's only gonna happen in cases where the SN2 is really slow for some reason. Which remember, We came, if we come back here to this table, SN2 reactions happen really, really fast when, you're, when your active carbon doesn't have anything else in the way. But the more other stuff you get around it, the slower it's going to go. So these SN1 reactions, the first order reactions, where the first step is, to, is your leaving group leaves and you make a carbocation, <clears throat> are going to happen predominantly when your SN2 reactions are too slow. So we're going to see this mostly with tertiary carbons. You will see it some with secondary carbons, but it's going to be competing with the SN2 reaction. You're going to have both mechanisms happening at the same time which is the next thing I was gonna talk about here is how, how could we rank the reactivities? What would we expect to be the most reactive for SN1 reactions? For this mechanism where we have to make a carbocation intermediate and that's our, that's our slowest step. What's the, go ahead. Well, I was going to answer your question. I wasn't sure. Yeah, go ahead. So you're saying that it, it only happens with tertiary carbons because they're the most stable and that's the ones that can handle being the slow of a reaction. Is that what you're asking or? Exactly. Okay. So the shorthand for primary, secondary, tertiary is the degree symbol is like saying airy. So tertiary has going to be more reactive with this mechanism than secondary, which is going to be more reactive than primary which is gonna be more reactive than methyl. Right? And so it goes exactly opposite of SN2. SN2, it was the fastest when you had nothing in the way. 
SN1 is going to be the exact opposite because we have to make that unstable intermediate. So the more stable we can make that intermediate, the faster the reaction will go. And so it would look something like, uh, I'll just do it on the board. Um, if we look at a making a tertiary carbocation, that's way more stable than a secondary carbocation. That's that's why we have rearrangements, right? Was if we could go for a, from a secondary to a tertiary carbocation, that is a big enough jump in stability that we'll just straight up move a hydrogen over, right? So the same thing is true here. If we have a we have energy versus reaction. If it's and our general shape is going to look something like that. Here's our carbocation intermediate right here in the middle. If this is what it looks like for to make a tertiary carbocation, a secondary carbocation is going to have something that looks more like this. The overall reaction energy is going to be close to the same because we're still making and breaking the same types of bonds. But the intermediate has got to be much higher in energy if we're making a secondary carbocation. Right? Because secondary is less stable than tertiary. And the, the potential energy surface for a primary would be off the board at the top. Again, same overall reaction energy because we're still making and breaking the same types of bonds, but our transition state is gonna be way up here. And our intermediate energy is gonna be way up here because a primary carbocation is much less stable than secondary, which is much, much less stable than tertiary. Yeah, cool, I see it. Okay, so it's, these two mechanisms, we call them competing mechanisms, but they're, and they, they do sometimes, but generally we're going to favor one or the other because they have these opposite reactivities. If it's a primary halide, it's going to go SN2 really quickly because there's not, no spinach getting in the way. If it's a tertiary halide, it's never going to go SN2. It's never going to go in that one step reaction, but it will go through this two step version because you can make a tertiary carbocation as your intermediate. And so we're going to continue to explore why these things go one way versus the other. And I see a few of you guys are asking to slow down. So I, I hear that. Um, for this second part, how do these reactivities compare to the SN2? It's going to be exactly opposite. Faster SN2 means slower SN1. Because a faster, so SN2, was methyl is screen sharing yes thank you faster for sn2 methyls reacted faster than primary which reacted faster than secondary and faster than tertiary tertiary have was so slow in the sn2 we said it was too slow to measure So the fact that we've got for SN1, is going to be the exact opposite. Tertiary is faster in SN1 than secondary, which is faster than primary, which is faster than methyl.
And in fact, the, the difference in rates is so great that we can basically, the only time we have to worry about both of these happening at the same time is when it's a secondary carbon. A secondary carbocation is stable enough that we can see a secondary carbocation form. And it's the secondary reaction for SN2 is slow enough that the SN1 can keep up with it. If it's a tertiary alkyl halide, it's gonna go SN1 every time. If it's a primary or methyl alkyl halide, it's gonna go SN2 every time. If it's secondary, we have to look at some other variables. So what other variables might there be? What could make things favor a one-step reaction versus a two-step reaction? Does it have to do with the type of nucleophile? The type of nucleophile. What, so in general, why, so SN1 followed this order, primary is faster or is slower um, than secondary is slower than tertiary. It followed that order because of stability of the intermediate too, right? So is there another way you could stabilize the intermediate, make the carbocation more stable? The solvent, it's in. Yeah, if we have something that can, that has, forms favorable bonds, hydro, you know, just um, van der Waals interactions, that in, we'd have dipole, ion dipole interactions, right? You guys remember those? That's why salt dissolves in water is because you can form all those favorable sodium ions, form a favorable bond with all the, the oxygens in water. So we can act, we, there are other ways we can stabilize that intermediate by changing what the solvent is. If we make it so that the solvent has more interactions with the carbocation, we can drop the, the energy of our intermediates significantly strength of the nucleophile. And what's, what is our, our slow step for SN1? The leaving group leaves. Leaving group leaves, right? So in addition to changing the strength of the nucleophile, if we change how good of a leaving group it is, that could make it better, right? If you don't have a very good leaving group, it's not going to be likely to go through this SN1 mechanism because a bad leaving group is not going to leave and leave behind a positive charge. It's going to stay attached. So the strength of the leaving group, the strength of the nucleophile and solvent are, are three of the most important variables. So we'll go over this slide and then we'll take our break and let you guys digest. And then we'll, we'll go, go over it again and do some practice. Um, if we have a good leaving group, that's not what I mean. Okay. A good leaving group is gonna favor SN1 because it's not going to wait for your nucleophile to come in and force it to leave. It'll leave on its own. The stability of the carbocation, the stability of the intermediate is the other, is an, the other largest factor here. Is, is it, are we going to make a primary carbocation or a secondary carbocation or a tertiary carbocation. The more substituted the carbocation that you're gonna make, the faster that will go because the more stable your intermediate will be.
And then nucleophile strength does play a role to some extent. It doesn't affect your SN1 rate, but it'll make your SN2 reaction go faster if you have a stronger nucleophile. Because it's more, it's more likely to see a partial positive and stick to it and force your leaving group to leave. If you have a, a weak nucleophile, like water is a fairly weak nucleophile, water is pretty stable on its own. It's why it makes up as much of our surface of our planet as it does. It's relatively stable. It doesn't have a huge driving force to go seek out a positive charge, a partial positive, and make a new covalent bond because the oxygen's already got a formal charge of zero. It's going to be attracted to partial positives but not super attractive. It's not gonna be a really strong attractive force towards those partial positives. Hydroxide on the other hand is a much better nucleophile because a negative, a full negative charge is gonna be way more attracted to a partial positive. So a stronger nucleophile is gonna be more likely to go through SN2 through the second order version where everything happens at once because it's pushier if you want to give these these molecules personality a a strong nucleophile is more is we, we can go ahead and say a strong nucleophile is a karen it's going to demand to talk to the manager and it's going to get what it wants a weak nucleophile is somebody who oh I didn't get the right order. That's okay. I'm just going to eat it anyway. Like a reasonable person. I actually, I shouldn't say that. There are times when I would send food back, I'm sure. But in general, that's it has to do with personality, right? And so nucleophile strength, you can relate to how pushy a person is. And the pushier person is going to make something happen all at once, as opposed to waiting for something else to leave. The last factor here is, is there a better way to do things? Even if your, if your carbocation is only going to be second order or secondary carbocation, then we had to worry about primary versus, or we had to worry about SN1 versus SN2. But if we can rearrange the carbocation to make something more stable, that's going to favor going through that two-step reaction because if you if your leaving group leaves and then all of a sudden you can make things more stable, the molecule will tend to do that. So, for instance, if we have a cyclohexane or cyclopentane group and then two carbons and then a chlorine versus a cyclopentane group with one carbon and then a chlorine. If this, this one can rearrange to make a secondary carbocation, if we, if this chlorine left, we'd be left with a positive charge on the primary carbon. And then you could move a hydrogen over to make a positive charge on the secondary carbon. That's more stable than it was. And that's, that means SN1 is going to play more of a role than we would normally expect for a primary alkyl halide. But if we could do a, if we had it set up here, our, our, intermediate in both of these cases. So if let's say a leaving group leaves in both of these cases. And takes the electrons with it. Both of these are super unstable. Primary carbocations are not good at all. This one could rearrange by moving a hydrogen over to be a secondary carbocation. If this one rearranges, it'll make a tertiary carbocation, which is even more stable, right? So the fact that we can go, it, even though it's a primary alkyl halide, we would expect SN1 to, to be really slow compared to SN2. 
the fact that our intermediate can be rearranged to go from primary to tertiary, that's such a big jump in stability that we actually would, would observe a little bit of the SN1 product in this case, which, and we will practice with what those products look like. That was mainly, um, to remind you Carbo, that rearrangement can happen. It doesn't, it's not that big of a, of a factor as to how fast it will happen because you still need your leaving group to leave. But it means that if you do have your leaving group leave, that is one more step to pay attention to because it will always rearrange to make the more stable intermediate before your nucleophile can come in and attach. We don't see that, we didn't see that with SN2 because it all happened in one step. There was no pause in the middle to rearrange things and make things better. All right. We'll look at this one when we come back and do some practice with this and we'll keep expanding on this slowly. Um, let's come back at five after and we'll go from there.
Well, it looks like Nevada is still taking their time. So we will continue on our merry way. All right. So if we were going through an SN1 reaction, um, the first step is our most, is our slowest step. It's a rate determining step. So if I just ask for, if I write a problem where I say, what is the product? Um, you don't need to draw the entire mechanism, although it can still be helpful sometimes to make sure you get the right the right way. If you know the mechanism or um, aren't sure what the product would be, a lot of times drawing the mechanism is a good way to get there, um, especially once you get the hang of drawing them. So if we if we just have it memorized that SN that the substitution reactions pull a halide off and replace it with the nucleophile, then that's good enough to look at this and say, okay, I'm going to, the chlorine is going to be gone in my product. I'm going to add the hydroxide. Um, you might miss some of the finer points of it if it was something if it was a um, product that could go through a rearrangement. If our intermediate could go through a rearrangement, then you might miss that. Um, so if we if we look at what the mechanism would look like here, our first step in the top one would be the chloride leaves, which means our intermediate would then look like still going to look like hexane or sorry pentane. with a positive charge here. Then the hydroxide can come in and attack. So then our OH with a negative charge can come in here. And that negative charge is going to attach to the carbocation. And we're going to wind up with pentane with an OH group on carbon two. Right, so then our final product would look like this. Clear the annotations here. Oh. So our product would look something like this. Is it going to be a specific stereoisomer? Like the, the way SN2 went through that umbrella flip. So we only got one stereoisomer. Is that going to happen here? I don't think so, because once you got the carbocation, it should be able to come at any angle, right? Right, because what does a carbocation look like? Is it tetrahedral? Uh, I think it's planar, right? It's planar. It's missing. It doesn't have that full p orbital, right? So it only has three electron groups, and then it has an unhybridized p orbital in there which is why carbocations can participate in resonance, right? They have that empty spot that electrons can jump into. And that, so that unhybridized p orbital is going to be sticking up and down. And it's going to have the, you know, the phase, but remember the phase is not indicative of the charge. That's just showing that, that you know, you had two different colors of those two lobes which means when your hydroxide comes in here, it can come in from either side to start to fill that orbital. It's not stuck only going through the backside attack because there is no backside. It's, the, it's a symmetrical molecule on top and bottom. So we will actually get, if it goes through um, SN1, we will get a mixture of both stereoisomers. If our product has a potential has an asymmetric carbon like this one would 
we will get a mixture of R and S if it goes through SN1. If it goes through SN2, you only get the one stereoisomer because it has to go through that backside attack. Right, so this does actually have some, some implications in terms of, of synthesis because these stereoisomers wind up making a difference a lot in the pharmaceutical industry, especially. Just like your right hand can't fit into a left-handed glove, you need specific stereoisomers of most medications in order for them to actually work properly and bind to the proper um, binding sites. So, and a, a good example of that is a compound called thalidomide. Thalidomide is this compound here that has an asymmetric center on this nitrogen. This nitrogen can be R or S. If this nitrogen can be R or S, that's gonna affect what binding sites it fits into. So if, and this was a big deal in the, in the sixties, this was, this was a, um, a drug that was marketed that targeted, treated um, nausea. It was an anti-nausea drug in the sixties. And in Europe, um, especially that was being prescribed pretty quickly as a, you need to go with one. Um, it was being prescribed um, as a morning flu um, treatment to reduce nausea in, in pregnant women. Um, it wasn't until, and the, and the U.S. didn't do this. The U.S., there was a woman at the FDA who said, we don't have enough trials. We need to wait. We need to wait. We need to wait. And they found out later um, when these children started being born with these, with horrible deformities, missing limbs, um, that that was related to the wrong stereoisomer of thalidomide being present. They were prescribing it as a mixture of R and S because that was the easiest way to make it in a lab and they didn't think there were any side effects. Turns out developing tissue, growing tissue that's going through mitosis is, is severely inhibited by the wrong stereoisomer here. And so a fetus growing um, was basically, it was, its growth was being totally shut down by this drug because it was a mixture, being prescribed as a mixture of both stereoisomers. Um, so now thalidomide has gotten such a bad rap, they won't even prescribe the right stereoisomer um, as anti-nausea because nobody in there, you know, is going to take that chance. And most people don't understand the difference between the two. Um, but actually the, the wrong, quote unquote, wrong isomer is actually being used as an anti-cancer drug at this point as a form of chemotherapy, because what is a tumor is just tissue that's growing when it shouldn't be, right? And so they're actually looking at using it with injections um, to slow the growth of, of cancers by basically doing the same thing that caused all those horrible birth defects in, in fetuses in the 60s. Um, so that also is just a good example of um, the poison is in the dose and in the usage. It doesn't, you know, the, something that's terribly dangerous for one individual can be exactly what you need for another individual that's in different circumstances. Um, interesting, just in good historical side note about why we wanna pay attention to which stereoisomer we're getting um, makes a big difference. And that's why SN1 versus SN2 can play a big role in this as well. Um, if we look at, and once again, there's that same typo there. You can tell that I copy and paste things from my other slides, huh? Um, if our bottom reaction went through an SN1 reaction, if it went through the first order reaction where the first step is leaving group leaves, what's gonna happen? What's our intermediate going to look like? You're gonna get a tertiary carbocation with the methyl group there? Yeah, because we've got, it's gonna start as as this, as our intermediate. Positive charge on the carbon here, but this carbon next door has a hydrogen that can move over, right? Which would make it a 
So right now it's a secondary carbocation, but if we move this hydrogen over, if, if the electrons move over to the secondary carbon and bring the hydrogen with it, we're gonna wind up with a tertiary carbocation, which once again, a tertiary carbocation is going to be totally planar. So we're gonna lose the stereochemistry and the, the new site that's going to actually have its, oops, it's not what I meant to do. Um, we're gonna wind up with that being neutral, not having the hydrogen here. That's gonna be planar because we have a carbocation right here and carbocations are flat, right? Because they're sp2 hybridization. So that means our product then is going to be our nitrogen is going to come in and attach to one side of the tertiary carbon. So our product would look like that. Draw the hydrogens if you want. Right. So the fact that this, if we say what is the product of the SN1 reaction? In this case, it's not just a matter of we're going to lose the stereochemistry if it goes SN1. We actually get a totally different product. We get a different constitutional isomer if it goes through SN1 versus SN2. So considering a huge chunk of OCHEM research, but just in general, um, OCHEM history is how do we make the right molecule? Being able to, to predict and control which mechanism it goes through is going to make a difference here. So, and then I, I did draw the final product there, right? Yeah. It also means if we did this bottom reaction, we're going to wind up with a big variety of products. We're going to get some of the products are just going to, are going to be the SN2 product where it's going to look like it went through the SN2 mechanism where you wind up with a cis product where, with the nitrogen and the methyl group being cis next to each other. Some of it's going to go through the SN1 mechanism that's going to look like the nitrogen and the methyl on the same carbon. Right? So the fact that we have these competing mechanisms means we're almost always going to get a mixture of products. It's just a matter of how do we maximize the product we want and minimize the other stuff. And then eventually one of the biggest chunks of lab um, in this, in this class is now that we did this synthesis, how do we get rid of all the other garbage that we didn't want? That's the byproducts. It's the stuff that we weren't trying to make, but is going to get made to some extent. And so that's almost all of OCHEM lab is um, either extract a natural product from something or you set up a synthesis, which usually means set, set up a glassware apparatus and watch something boil for half an hour and then purify it, purify it, purify it, purify it, do recrystallizations, do dis distillations, do both. Um, that's nine tenths of what you would be doing in lab would just be those three steps, extraction, react, react purify. All right, let's let me get that on the right spot here. Um, let's talk about a little bit about what makes a good nucleophile, since that was one of the things that can affect this, um, which can affect which mechanism we go through. Um, we, we use the adjective nucleophilicity, um, which is a mouthful, but it just means how strong is your nucleophile um or how attracted is your reactant to a positive charge to put in even more basic terms right that's what a nucleophile is is it's a molecule that's attracted to a positive or a partial positive charge um and there's usually usually good leaving groups are also 
weak nucleophiles because if they're good at leaving, it means that they're not very attracted to a positive charge. That's why they're able to leave. But there are some exceptions to that. Um, and so in general, we're just going to have sort of two classes for these. And I will have a, um, when we start, when we explore elimination reactions next week, um, I'll have a, I have a good figure that kind of breaks down all of this different, different information in one eight by eight by 11 um, sheet. Um, but we basically have diff some just general classifications, strong nucleophiles um, almost always means that they're going to have a full negative charge, not just a partial negative. Um, weak nucleophiles are relatively stable on their own. And so they tend to be things that don't have a charge to them. Stuff like water is a weak nucleophile. Um, this molecule here, that's an alcohol, an OH group. Um, I'm not sure we used R groups in this class yet. Have I just talked about what R means? seeing some confused faces. So I should go back over it, even if we have. Um, An R group is just a placeholder that just means something carbon-based. So whatever R is, this is just saying any, any alcohol, any OH group on an organic molecule is going to be a weak nucleophile. Over here, this is saying if you deprotonate that alcohol, it's a strong nucleophile. So if we put it under super basic conditions and we deprotonate an, um, an OH group, so we just have an oxygen with a negative charge, all of a sudden that's a strong nucleophile. And so that can affect which, which path we go through. Strong nucleophiles are gonna be much more likely to go through SN2 mechanisms because they're gonna seek out that pos partial positive charge on your alkyl halide and push the leaving group off. Um, weak nucleophiles are not. So our strong nucleophiles were our Karens. And our weak nucleophiles are, are just going to wait for things to happen and then swoop in and react with the positive charge. Um, in terms of if you, um, if you have uh, ever worked as a server in a restaurant, you know, there's always that person that's anxious to get their table at the bar in the bar area that's open seating that goes up to the group that's finishing up and says, are you guys ready to leave yet? That kind of like shoes them out the door. That's your strong nucleophiles and your weak nucleophiles are sitting there at the bar, drinking their drink, eyeing the table, but waiting for the other group to leave. Fluoride is interesting. Fluoride's not on this list. If you notice, all of our halides are actually in here as strong nucleophiles, but they're also good leaving groups. Um, fluoride, on the other hand, depends on the solvent. Because if you put fluoride in the right solvent, it's not, it's mostly going to be present in its um, in its protonated form. Fluoride's a weak acid, right? Or hydrofluoric acid is a weak acid. And so HF, if you have it present in water, is going to be present. I think it's, if you put hydrofluoric acid in water, our acid dissociation reaction would look something like this, right? Plus fluoride. And Ka for for hydrofluoric acid is like 10 to the minus four, something along those lines. In which which means almost all of your molecules are going to be present as the protonated form if you do this in this reaction in water. If you put sodium fluoride in water, most of it's going to steal a hydrogen from um, from a water molecule and become HF. Fluoride acts as a weak base if you put it with water which means if most of your fluoride is actually present as HF, it can't be a very good nucleophile. So HF would be in our weak nucleophile stage. Fluoride can be a pretty good nucleophile, but it has to be in a solvent that doesn't let it steal a proton. 
And we're going to see this solvent plays a big role in these reactions because it also affects how stable our intermediates are. If we put, if we have a nonpolar solvent, SN2 reactions are typically very slow. I'm going to, I'm bringing us back to that point I just made. So if, if that was tricky or you didn't fully understand what I was saying, hold on for a second. If we put, if we have a reaction happening in a nonpolar solvent, SN2 reactions are slow. Why might that be the case? I don't know, just attractive forces between all the hydrocarbons. Attractive forces between the hydrocarbons, but remember, those are usually pretty pretty weak interactions, right? Those are those London dispersion forces. They're not. We don't actually have any dipole dipole attractions, right? If it's a nonpolar solvent. And what does that tell us? Can we have a strong nucleophile dissolved in a nonpolar solvent? What did all these strong nucleophiles have in common? Negative charges. Negative charges. It's really hard to get a strong nucleophile in a nonpolar solvent because you need a negative charge for it to be a strong nucleophile. And negative charges don't want to dissolve in a nonpolar solvent. They're going to stay attracted to whatever positive charge is around. Would we expect SN1 reactions to go quickly in a nonpolar solvent? SN1 reactions, we, a, new, a weak nucleophile could still work, right? Because we're waiting for a leaving group to leave before before our nucleophiles come in and attach, if it's SN1. But is our what's going to happen to our leaving group leaving? Is that going to be faster or slower if we're in a nonpolar solvent? Slower because the negative charge on the leaving group? Because our leaving, we're making two charged molecules when our leaving group leaves, right? We're making a carbocation and our leaving group itself has a negative charge usually which means that's going to be even slower than it normally would be. So SN2 reactions can be can go slow in a nonpolar solvent, but SN1 reactions are basically never going to happen in a nonpolar solvent. Because we not only are we going uphill in energy to make a carbocation that's less stable, if we don't have a polar solvent that can stabilize the intermediate and make it relatively stable, it's going to be really unlikely that our leaving group leaves on its own. So choice of solvent plays a big role in this because we can basically stop SN1 reactions in their tracks by doing a reaction in a nonpolar solvent. If we, and this is more talking about the, what happens when you put fluoride in water If we put fluoride or any of these strong, these uh, basic nucleophiles in water, they're going to pro get protonated, right? They're going to go from being a, a strong nucleophile to a weak nucleophile. Fluoride is a, is a strong nucleophile, but when you put it in water, you make a weak nucleophile. And same with a lot of these others. If you put hydroxide in water, well, hydroxide in water, it's a conjugate base. That's not a great example. But if you put um, these deprotonated alcohols in water, they're just going to steal a proton from water and make hydroxide, which is not as strong of a nucleophile. You're going to go from having strong nucleophiles to weaker nucleophiles if you do these reactions in water. So we can't use... We can't use polar or we can't use water as our solvent for these unless our nucleophile is hydroxide. We also can't 
use a totally nonpolar solvent because then we can't get our strong nucleophile dissolved and SN1 reactions won't happen either. So what it comes down to is we're gonna need another classification um, for our solvents. And so the next slide is going through, okay, if we put if we use a polar solvent, if we use a polar solvent like water, we can stabilize these ions like we were talking about. But we don't want to allow them, we don't want to deprotonate the water because then our nucleophile is not gonna stay the same. Our nucleophile is gonna change and we're gonna wind up with a big mess of products. Um, and however, if we look at what happens to these reactions, if we do a less polar solvent, that's always going to slow things down. Because if it's SN1 reaction, we're, we're going to wind up with a less stable intermediate. Even if it's an SN2 reaction, um, our nucleophile can't be as strong if it's in a nonpolar solvent. So a less polar solvent is not always the answer either. If we want this reaction to happen, and if we want to be able to control what the nucleophile is, we need a polar solvent that won't protonate anything. We want a polar solvent that will keep our strong nucleophiles strong nucleophiles and stable stabilize our reactants and products that won't where a strong base will not interfere with it, will not protonate it, deprotonate our solvent. And make sure I'm presenting this in the right order. So this is our, our problem here. We want to stabilize the reactants and transition states with a polar solvent, but we don't want to stabilize the reactants too much. Because if we can stabilize our transition state and our, um, and our products without stabilizing our reactants too much, that's going to make this reaction go even faster. Right. If we stabilize everything the same amount, then that's not going to speed up our reaction at all. Right. Because our transition state barrier would still be just as high relative to where we started. But if we can stabilize the transition state and the products without stabilizing the reactants, that's going to make our reaction go faster. And so that our new classification of solvents is called a polar aprotic solvent. Protic means has a proton it can give up. Protic means it's a weak acid, even if it's a very weak acid. It's like water, methanol, ethanol, ammonia are all protic solvents. They're all polar, and they also all have an H plus they can give up. My cat's being a cat, knocking over my molecular models. Um, we, if we want a something that's polar, that's not protic, that won't give up an H plus, we have this other this other class of solvents um, that are only they're used almost exclusively for OCHEM um, because if we want to stabilize things, but we don't want to stabilize them too much. And, or we don't want to mix up what our nucleophile is, we have to use something that won't act as an acid. Hence the term aprotic, without a proton. It's not really without a proton. Acetone's got hydrogens on it, but it doesn't have an acidic proton. It doesn't have an H plus that it can give up to a strong base. So a lot of times we'll wind up using these as our solvents as a way to make sure that we keep the right molecule as our nucleophile. All right, I have to grab my cat and throw her outside real quick. I'll let you ponder this and look at this figure for a second while I do that.
get a hand it to cats. They know how to get your attention. Um, so if we wanted to use a polar aprotic solvent, we can still stabilize charges with an ion with a ion dipole interaction, but we're not going to be able to pull any hydrogens off of those aprotic solvents to make them um, to allow the nucleophile to act as a base. And we we also limit how, how much it can stabilize a negative charge. In a polar aprotic solvent, we're not going to stabilize the nucleophile too much because the positive side of these molecules winds up being sterically inaccessible, is the phrase we use. Sterics meaning there's just too much stuff in the way. So the partial positive side of these molecules winds up being less useful. So we can stabilize transition states like a carbocation without stabilizing the nucleophile too much and without allowing the nucleophile to become protonated. And so, and we can see some, some another good table here. If we look at iodine, bromine and chlorine, bromide, iodide, and chloride is in uh, water, they're already weak, very, very weak bases. So, so weak that we would say that they're not weak bases at all. They're just ions when you dissolve them in water. Um, so they're not going to be affected too much by whether it's a protic or not, not nearly as much as something like fluoride. But it, look at the size of these reaction rates. This is all relative to bromide acting as a nucleophile in methanol, which is protic. DMF, dimethylformamide, is just as polar, is the same level of polarity as methanol. But the rate happens 20,000 times faster for bromide. Because it's aprotic, because we can't stabilize the bromide very much. It'll dissolve a little bit, but it's not going to be so stable that the bromide can't get in there and act as a nucleophile. Um, and if you look at the stronger bases like fluoride, our, our reaction goes up much, much more. 82 million times faster. That's basically a big enough jump that we can say it's totally won't happen in methanol because the methanol stabilizes the fluoride too much. But when you do it in an aprotic solvent, it becomes a really good nucleophile. All right, hang on one second while I decide where is a, a good place. All right, so here's, here's the practical results of that. The strong base will also be the strongest nucleophile unless the reaction happens in a protic solvent. And if the bases differ in size, that can affect things as well, because the size of the base is going to affect how much stabilization can happen. If we look at this complicated figure here, so fluoride is the best base out of these, which means it should be the best nucleophile as well, unless we're in a protic solvent. So increasing nucleophilicity in a aprotic polar solvent. So because fluoride can be so stabilized by a protic solvent, it becomes a really bad nucleophile in a protic solvent. If we put it into a, so if, if we're in a protic solvent, the biggest 
nucleophile is the strongest nucleophile because it's going to be less stabilized by the, by the protons, by the solvent. If we're in an aprotic solvent, it's the exact opposite. If we're in an aprotic solvent, strongest base is the strongest nucleophile. Right, so this first sentence is usually the most important rule. This is the general rule. Strongest base will be the strongest nucleophile. If these two conditions are met, that's going to be reversed. If it's in a protic solvent and you have a significant difference in size, then that trend flips. The weakest base will be the strongest nucleophile. Which is really weird. See, it takes a lot of getting used to. And again, we're gonna come up with a lot of these. Here's your general rule, here's the exception for SN1 versus SN2. And when we do elimination reactions, the same thing, we're gonna have E1 and E2. And we're going to have a lot of these. Here's the favorite product unless, or this mechanism is going to be favored if it's this type of reactant, unless you change the solvent or unless your nucleophile is protonated. It's which will significantly change what product we get, right? So this is most of what we're going to do the rest of this quarter is nail down these those four mechanisms, SN1, SN2, and then elimination one first order and elimination second order. So if you're feeling lost right now, don't worry, we're going to keep going over this and over this and over this until it's cemented in your brain for all time, probably. If you ask anybody who got an A in, a in OCHEM 1, no matter what field they're in now, um, if they've taken OCHEM 1 in the last 15 years, they know what, it, they remember SN2 mechanisms. They might not be able to tell you what, which of these it'll go through, but they'll remember, oh, SN2, leaving group leaves, backside attack. And that we're gonna go over these to the point where you won't forget it. You might forget finer details, but that's what cheat sheets are for and the internet, right? All right, so let's do some more practice here. And let me rearrange this just a little bit. If we want to know what the different react or the different products will be, especially if I tell you what the mechanism is, that removes a lot of the uncertainty. Right. If I tell you it's SN2, that means it's the second order reaction. It means everything's happening at once. So what is our nucleophile and what is it going to do um, for this first reaction? What part of the NH3 is going to act as our nucleophile? Lone pair, right? Yeah. One, one of the first things I said is that a nucleophile has to have a lone pair in order to, to attack, right? And if it's SN2, backside attack, bromine leaves. So our product would look like Would look like this positive charge on the nitrogen without drawing the proton transfer step at the end. Is this 
and then our leaving group would then be the bromide. How do we know whether products or reactants are going to be favored here? How do we know what's a better nucleophile? Would we look at charges? Look at charges. We also look at these Ka values, right? Because our general rule, our most common rule was stronger base is a better nucleophile. Unless we met both of those two criteria, unless it was in a polar protic solvent, and also there was a difference in size. And I didn't explicitly say it, but when you see something written like this in OCHEM, that usually means that's our solvent. This has to happen in DMF, DMF, which was dimethylformamide, polar aprotic solvent. So if it's in an aprotic solvent, the stronger base is the stronger nucleophile. So out of our two options, our two options are NH3 or bromide. Which one's the better nucleophile? First off, which is the better base? A higher pKa, must be pKa, not Ka. A higher pKa means it's a that the conjugate base is a stronger base. Higher pKa means it's harder to deprotonate the acid. So ammonia is a better base than bromide, which if we're in a polar aprotic solvent also means ammonia is a better nucleophile. If it's a better nucleophile, are we going to favor the products or the reactants here? Products. Yeah. Yeah. We made the more stable say so this is this is very similar to if you were looking at an acid base reaction, you want to know our products or reactants favored. You looked at, okay, here's the base on this side, here's the conjugate base on the other side, which of them is a better base? And your goal is going to make make the more stable product, which means you're going to make the less strong base, the weaker base is going to be favored at equilibrium. Because that means that you have something that's more stable that way. All right, so for this first reaction, products are favored. And our product would look like this. Be the, it'd be a three, an amine on the third carbon. And if it goes through SN2, there's no rearranging that happens. And you only get one stereoisomer. Do one more and we'll be done for the day. Let me clear off all my mess here. DMSO. Again, I don't expect you to know that off the top of your head though, there, but if we go back and look at our polar aprotic solvent, dimeth or DMSO is dimethyl sulfoxide, which fit into our category of, of polar aprotic solvents. So that means fluorine is going to come in backside attack, bromide leaves. we're going to wind up with
This is our product plus bromide. Which side is favored at equilibrium? We're in a polar aprotic solvent, which means stronger base is the stronger nucleophile. And fluoride has a much higher pKa than bromide. So at equilibrium, we will favor making the products here. I know I said we were going to just do that one, but this last one makes the point that the solvent matters. This last one looks is the same reaction as up above, but done in water which is a protic solvent, which means our normal trends get flipped. Our product, if it's SN2, is still going to look the same. But as far as which side is favored at equilibrium, we have a difference in size. We have second row of the periodic table and we have fourth row of the periodic table. So big difference in size of our nucleophiles and we're in a protic solvent, which means our normal trend gets flipped upside down. So if we do this reaction in water, the reactants are favored at equilibrium. which means we could even start with this as our product. If we put it into water with bromide at equilibrium, the bromide, which is normally pretty inert, will actually wind up displacing the, the amine to make this product at equilibrium. If we do the same reaction in a different solvent, we favor the exact opposite thing happening. So one more time. Strongest base will also be the strongest nucleophile unless both of these are true. You have to be in a protic solvent and your bases have to be a different size. So if you're going to remember one thing from this slide, remember the first line. Because usually we try to avoid using water as a solvent in OCHEM anyway, because we don't want to deal with the exceptions usually. Usually, we want to just be able to say strongest base is the strongest nucleophile. Done. Right? But it will affect what the product is and what's favored at equilibrium. So I'm going to stop now since I know I've already gone over.